The history of Britain has often been shaped by war. Our ancestors fought to defend their land, their cultures and their beliefs, sometimes against invaders like the Normans and the Romans, constantly getting driven back here, and other times against their fellow countrymen. Forget your chivalry. This is life or death. And I'm curious to learn more about the key battles in British history to discover how they've influenced our past and our present. From the massacre of a Celtic warrior queen and her army. They're coming for you, and they're covered in steel. To the Scottish king who defied the odds in a fight for independence. A poorly armed band of men going up against the might of Christendom. So I'll be meeting historians, archaeologists, weapons experts, and enthusiasts who continue to live and breathe the stories. To find out how six critical battles change the path of this country. I'm in Leicestershire, on my way to Ambien Hill, just south of Market Bosworth. Over 500 years ago, a defining moment in English history took place here. The Battle of Bosworth was the final chapter in the Wars of the Roses, a series of conflicts in which two rival dynasties, the White Rose of the Yorks, and the Red Rose of the Lancasters fought for control of the throne over 30 years. The conflict would inspire playwright William Shakespeare to tell the story of his most famous villain, the hunchbacked Richard III, and prompt a great discovery 500 years later. In 1483, England's king, Edward IV, died at the age of 40. His eldest son, Edward, was heir to the throne but at 12 years old, he was too young to govern. His uncle, Richard, was named Lord Protector to act on behalf of the young king until he came of age. But some believe that Richard had devious intentions, and life for young Edward and his little brother, Richard, seems to have turned into a horror story. Richard had Edward and his younger brother held under lock and key here at the Tower of London supposedly for their own protection. But after Richard was crowned king, the two princes were never seen in public again, and rumors began to circulate that they'd been murdered. The boys were never seen in public, and I think it's pretty obvious by the end of the year there were many people in England and abroad that thought they were dead. Of course, once Richard is king, then he cannot let them survive, really, because he has a son of his own and he will be wanting to create a dynasty of his own. With the princes out of the way, the Yorkist Richard faced another threat, this time from Lancastrian Henry Tudor, who for the last 14 years had been living in Brittany. Henry Tudor was a pretty much a non-entity, but he's the last man standing in the Lancastrian line, which has gone through great difficulties, really, in the, uh, the Wars of the Roses, and essentially the Yorkists have triumphed, and by various means, the only surviving male heir is Henry Tudor. Determined to stake his claim to the throne, Henry mustered a small army of French soldiers and set sail to overthrow Richard. Henry Tudor and his invasion force landed in a bay near the Welsh village of Dale in Pembrokeshire on the 1st of August, 1485. Apparently, Henry fell to his knees on the beach, looked to the heavens and cried, judge me, O Lord, and favor my cause. He knew the odds of success were stacked against him. News of Henry's arrival reached Richard, who quickly raised an army to challenge him. He chose Ambien Hill in Warwickshire as the best tactical position to block Henry's route to London. Historian Matt Lewis has agreed to show me the site. Well, here we are atop Ambien Hill. I mean, it's, it's a very commanding position up here, isn't it? I mean, great view out in, in all directions. The view is what it's all about. So you position yourself up here, you can see approaching armies for miles around, no one can be quite certain where Henry Tudor's arm is going to come from. So Richard III positions himself along this top of this hill, 
And it's in the fields surrounding us here, then, that the Battle of Bosworth took place. Absolutely. This is where Richard musters his men and strings them out along the hill, but it's in the fields down the bottom where the fighting would have taken place, and it would have spread out over potentially several miles. One thing that puzzles me slightly, Matt, is here we are in Leicestershire. We're in, in the middle of the country. Why here? Richard, he's not sure where Henry is going to land, and when he gets the news that Henry's landed in Wales, he orders a muster at Leicester, with the aim of cutting Henry off. So Henry heads north up the Welsh coast yep. and then east inland through Shrewsbury and begins to head down Watling Street, the old Roman road, which is now the A5. So this is the point at which Richard manages to sort of cut him off because if, if Henry reaches London, then Richard could be in real trouble. Control of the capital gives someone control of the kingdom. Who was Richard's army then? John Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, who was a, an old soldier. Um, he's here with his son, the Earl of Surrey. Um, and he leads Richard's vanguard, so the first, the front portion of Richard's army, the men that will engage first. And this is what, thousands of men for, on behalf yes, of them? Yes, it would have been, yes, absolutely. Two, three thousand with Norfolk, several thousand with Richard in the centre, and a couple of thousand with the Earl of Northumberland at the back. So Henry Percy, the Earl of Northumberland, has travelled down from the north to come here, and he's given command of Richard's rear guard. And Richard potentially has maybe twice as many men with him as Henry has, so it allows him to string his men out over a long distance across the top of that ridge, and it would be intimidating for Henry and his men to march towards that and realise that that's the army they've got to fight. It will make them very well aware and possibly quite frightened of exactly what they're marching into. Putting yourself in Richard's shoes then, you'd have thought he'd have been quite optimistic about how the day was going to play out. I think so. I think he's very excited. I think there's a, a buzz among his household cavalry. He has these, this core of men who are really close to him, who have worked with him for 10 years, been in his service and a really, really a close, tight-knit unit around him. And I suspect that there was an awful lot of kind of nervous, excited energy going on as they're preparing for battle. They're putting on their armour, they're being dressed, ready for the fight. Their horses are, you know, stomping the ground and snorting in the cold morning air. It's all getting really, really exciting. The fighting is coming close. And I think Richard wants it. He's described as being excited. He's keen to get to the fight. Henry Tudor is kind of the, the very last vestige of any opposition to Richard III. So if he wipes out Henry today, he is king of the country, absolutely unrivaled. Henry's men march towards Ambien Hill to face the full force of Richard's artillery. I'm on my way to meet historian Julian Humphreys, who's going to tell me about what's been discovered at Fen Lane Farm, about the opening phase of the battle. Julian, good to see you. Grandstand view. This is it, is it? So Perfect, isn't it? This just gives us a better view of the lay of the land. Very much so, yeah. Now, as I understand it, for many years, it was believed that the Battle of Bosworth was fought, well, over by the visitor centre, by, by Abbey and Hill. Where is that? Absolutely, it was uh, up on the, on the high ground that you could see over in this direction, about a mile and a half away. There was this narrative which said, you know, that Richard III was up on Ambien Hill yeah. and Henry Tudor was below and the Stanleys were on this hill and so on and so on. But there are big problems with that uh, interpretation. All the sources talk about a marsh. Okay. Problem with Ambien Hill in that area, there is no marsh up there. So it's very much a case of find the marsh and you've just about found the battle. When was it then that this area started to be explored as a potential site for the Battle of Bosworth? So the big archaeological work was from 2005 to 2009, four years of looking. So it began then, did it, by needing to establish that there, there was a bog here? Well, you do that by soil analysis. So you look at the, at the soil, look to see if there's peat in it, etc. And by doing that, you can work out perhaps where the marshland was. You can look at the names of the places around here. And the fact that this road that runs uh, through the battlefield is called Fen Lane, it's a bit of a clue, isn't it? With the location of the marsh confirmed, the search began for physical evidence of the battle. So the way to find the debris is, is essentially through metal detecting. Right. So you go along in, um, in, in, in lines across an area and you, 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 you record what you find. It can be a bit problematical because, of course, there's loads of agricultural stuff that's, that's left around well, it's here. It's 500 years yeah. left of agriculture. So, you know, nails, horseshoes, goodness knows what, mm -hmm. you know, is going to be, be dropped here, you know, and, uh, and so you've got to deal with that, typically, really, just about to pack up and go home, not really having found anything. And then somebody suddenly said, oh, is this of interest? 
and it was a it was a, a, a lead cannonball, clearly from the medieval period. That then thought, right, let's let's crack on now. Let's just keep going with this. And you know, around about forty have been found now, scattered across this area. That's quite a haul, then, is it? It's yeah. the biggest uh, uh, assemblage of, of of cannonballs of that type anywhere, really. That must have been an incredibly exciting time then to, to have found that big a haul. Yes, when you've got this scatter of balls all over this area, it's clear that this was probably the sort of epicentre of, uh, of the of the fighting. Well, I've got a replica here, actually. It's a big, heavy lead object. Um, most of the ones that they found were lead, but some of them actually were stone with a core of lead. Feel it, it's very, very heavy. You can just imagine the damage that, that's going to be doing. Yes, it's going to do the end of a gun. Absolutely. Do we know how artillery would have been used at the Battle of Bosworth? You'd expect the, the, the guns to kind of open up the, the, the battle, really. So earlier periods, the battles begin with an exchange of, of arrow fire. You know, by this period, I think you're starting to see an exchange of artillery fire. With shots ringing out from both sides, the Battle of Bosworth was underway. At long range, you would fire a ball like this, and the idea was that it bounced along until it hit something or someone and then carried on with all of the energy that's in it until it ran out of energy. And by that time, it could have killed and maimed a large number of people. Mm. You know? um, at shorter ranges, sometimes it wasn't large balls like this, but it was sort of hail shot. So small balls or bits of lead or bits of stone or whatever, which would turn the, the, the guns into a, a sort of giant shotgun, really. So this stuff would come spewing out. Okay. And you could you'd use that perhaps in a more defensive way. We're told that the Battle of Bosworth began with Richard III's gunners opening fire on Henry's armies. To find out about the kind of artillery they used, I'm meeting weapons expert Magnus Sigurdsson. Hello, Magnus. It's toasty in here, tell you oh, what. you wouldn't be needing your coat or your hat in here. Those rings I can see in there, that's what we're looking at today, is it? That's what we're... Yes, they're reinforcing rings for a medieval cannon. Basically, what we hope stops it flying apart. How are these guns being manufactured then? Well, the bigger bores um, were built like a wooden barrel, hence a gun barrel is called a gun barrel. It was made out of staves with connecting hoops that held it all in place. That is exactly the same as a, yeah, well, like a barrel you fill with whiskey or beer or whatever. Or... Yeah, uh, some people have even put water in it, but yeah, if whiskey's your thing. <laughs> The large guns and, and cannon that were being used at the Battle of Bosworth, how long had those kind of guns been around? We've been trying to mess around with cannon from 1300s. Right. Um, it's just getting them so that they don't blow up most of the time. Guns exploded. If they were fired too quick, they overheated. So where, where's our barrel that needs reinforcing? Here's a piece that's been rolled and Is welded. It? That's already been... Yeah, it's quite thick walled to start with. Red hot, here it comes. Look at that. Hello. Right, you hit it. So this ring is... It actually fits brilliantly around that. Not, yeah. not by chance, I imagine. Like no, no, it's carefully sized. Look at that. So if we quench that, it will contract and hold it. And that's well and truly on. Magnus is keen for me to see a replica medieval cannon in action. Thankfully, he's moved it outside first. We tend to think of cannon and medieval battlefield guns as these great big instruments of war out there. I have to say, Magnus, this looks a little on the small side. This is actually a really good size for a battlefield piece. Huh. It's highly portable, movable. The bigger things you're thinking about are more siege weapons that are dragged up there on big sledges, and once they're in place, they're there. There is no chance that if you discover the enemy's moving slightly to the left flank, they're even moving them around to try and cover it. So this, a couple of men can pick it up, move it around, reset it up again, and away you go. How available were the skills needed to be firing guns and cannon out on the battlefield? Um, the skills needed were not very common. It was a highly skilled job, and you tended to employ mercenaries that were actually gunners and could do the job. What were the skills that you'd need? You actually have to understand how to mix and make good gunpowder. They'd actually be mixing the gunpowder out in the battlefield? They would actually be mixing it there on site. It wasn't transported, pre-mixed. Um, the other bad news about gunpowder is it goes bang. 
it goes bang near a spark it goes bang because it feels like it the main time it doesn't go bang is when you actually want it to what kind of range were available with those guns at the time you would actually get eight to nine hundred meters no problem All but right. that's with it getting there accuracy range is a lot shorter than that the enemy's there and you know you can reach the enemy they're sending in big blocks it's quite easy really I guess there's that intimidation factor of, of these big guns as well, is there? You're about to see, when we set this thing off, the fog of war, the smoke, the sheets of flame, the noise, you know, and to have that all sitting there opening fire towards you. And remember, these things are not hitting you individually close up. They're just tearing huge, great holes in people standing next to you. Heads are disappearing, holes the size of a fist are going through somebody's body, their legs missing. Has it gone boom? Very safe. I now need to carefully hand whittle a plug. You should always make sure that fully home, otherwise what you've got is a pipe bomb. This is the finer primer charge. So that's, that's our touch hole there. So this is this is exactly this is exactly the same way as you'd see on a, um, a flint lock or a match lock. Um, oh, exactly. Musket. It's just a more primitive form of it. So that gun is now absolutely ready to be fired. All it needs is a tiny bit of ignition, spark, a bit of flame. Stand back. So this is going to go big bang, is it? Here, no, this, is, this should set off an impressive bang. If there's enough of the match left. <sighs> I'm on tender hooks. It's not fun. I'm a bag of nerves. <laughs> oh! <laughs> And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you fire a medieval cannon. Ah! Oh, I don't know if my heart was pounding or if I actually felt the blast. I think I felt, you the, felt blast. the blast. Like, across my chest, across yeah. my whole torso, I felt that yeah. blast. And I'm behind the, the gun. Yeah. Oh, flipping heck. I don't know what to do with all this nervous energy and excitement I've got now. Run away. Run away. Run away. Amazing, Magnus. Thank you very much. No problem. It's said 140 cannon were fired at Bosworth, but they weren't the only artillery used. The 15th century saw the emergence of a new kind of foot soldier using a new kind of gun, the arquebus. Well, Ian, the first thing I notice about your, your clothing is the white boar on your tunic, which tells me that you are fighting on behalf of Richard III. You are a royalist. Very much so. So what, what kind of gun is this? This is an arquebus. An arquebus. Sort of mid, mid 15th century kind of gun. It's not accurate by any standards really the the ball it's a loose fit that's the, that's the ball that's going to be inside the gun yep it's loose in the barrel so which means as it comes out of the barrel it could already be deviating left right up or down a lot more chance of missing than hitting would you have to be fairly skilled then and well trained to be using an arquebus like this they're not difficult to use yeah um certainly not as skilled as an archer would be you could teach somebody to use this in half a day quite easily <laughs> a lot of people say that the gunners were fairly crazy. They, the technology wasn't reliable. There's a good chance that the piece itself is going to explode. Was artillery used on both sides then at the Battle of Bosworth? Both sides will have had artillery, but it's almost certain that Richard will have had a lot more in terms of the, particularly the bigger pieces. Yeah. Richard has, has got the stuff that's in the tower. Yep. And the men to do it. You know, you have Henry's coming across to, to Wales by sea, that's a lot bigger logistic issue to get those cannons across. How would that have affected the dynamic of the battle? For most people, it's still going to be a pretty scary thing to see. The loudest kind of things that people in normal, normal life would have heard would have been church bells, thunderstorms, and suddenly you've got these things going off with the associated flash and the smoke and the smell, the sulphur smell, which then in you know, a religion was very, very important. So that it's been associated with the devil. Right. And you know, somebody drops down dead next to you, you haven't seen them being hit with a sword or a pole arm. There's no arrow sticking in them. Yeah. But they're dead on the ground. And you, what's happened? Incredibly frightening. Incredibly frightening, yeah. But just how scary might the arquebus have been for those on the battlefield? It's time to find out. OK, so the first part of the loading process is to open the, the priming pan, take the top of the cartridge off, small amount of powder, into the pan, just to the top of the pan. Close the pan now, so that's secure. The rest of the charge, eight grams of powder in this case, into the barrel, 
followed by the remainder of the cartridge. I'm just going to tap that down. It's important not to hold the scouring stick. Because if it were to go off, ah. my fingers will go with it. Yeah. So we make it nice and tight at the bottom of the barrel. Make sure we've taken that out. Otherwise, we'd be firing that across the field as well. And the usual call is have a care. Have a care! And away we go. <laughs> so you get that flash, and then there's yep. a short gap, and then bang! That's right. The main charge goes down the barrel. When I light this one, that's the initial burn. And fingers crossed, we get a burn through into the main charge, and it sets that off. You know, the expression flash in the pan, if that had gone and the main barrel hasn't, there's a chance that it could go off in my face. It's got quite a loud bang to it, it the old does have a loud bang. isn't it? Yeah. They're a lot louder than a modern shotgun. You know, this, this ball, lead ball, if it hit you in the arm, it's going to shatter the bones in your arm. Mm. It's not going to be possible to set it. Mm. You're going to lose that arm at some stage. Yeah. And on the medieval battlefield, the chances are you're going to be dying of infections within a week or so. Right, my turn. Let's hope it doesn't blow up in my face. Open the pan. There we go. OK, there's your match. Give it a good blow on there, get it nice and hot, like a cigarette. Have a care! Oh, my God! <laughs> I knew what was coming. you now got what we call a gunner's grin. That's a gunner's grin, That's is a it? gunner's grin, right yeah, there. absolutely. I don't know how to get rid of that. <laughs> Have a care! As the first exchange of artillery fire came to an end, Richard's soldiers began to march down Ambien Hill to face Henry's men in bloody combat. I'm keen to find out about the men who fought for Henry, many of whom were French. Battle reenactor John Potter has brought along replicas of their weapons. John, you're, you're representing the mercenary side of Henry's army. Yeah, professional, right. professional soldiers for a wage, OK? We're not there for any loyalty to any banner or anything like that. We're simply making a living out of fighting on the battlefield. So you'll go where the fight is, because that's where you're going to make your living? Yeah, wherever there's the trouble's going to be, I'm going to be stealing stuff off the battlefield, and I'm going to be earning a good wage as well. How well trained would you have been? As, as the mercenaries, very well trained. There is a hardcore of, um, of the professional soldier in there, and also Henry's been allowed to go to the French prisons and take men from there as well. In there, you're going to have ne'er-do-wells, murderers, cutthroats, thieves, maybe the better sort of person you'd want on the battlefield yeah. rather than a gentleman. So as a professional soldier then, John, what, what would you have been fighting with? We're going to be fighting on foot, so we're going to be using a lot of pole arms. If this is spear, it's going to be common on the battlefield, sometimes shortened to be used even more effectively. So you, you'd have been using this in in amongst ranks then, would you? Not, not necessarily on, on your own. It's going to be a whole formation of men that may need to protect themselves from cavalry coming in or will be trying to break through ranks. Well, what else have you got here, then? Okay. We're not just using um, the simple spear, though. We're going to use bladed weapons like this. Well, that's right, so what's this called here? This, this is a halberd. It's got, um, it's got a, a spike for stabbing, but now also... You've got this Great heavy blade, blade here. Yeah. Can you imagine this coming hard, swung hard down, saying to your collarbones like that. It's going to cleave its way through flesh and bone very, very easily. Can I have a feel of that? See Certainly, what the weight, feel the the weight, weight of that is. Imagine Ooh, that, yeah, that being swung at you. It's with very full top belt. heavy, isn't it? It wants to be swung. Yeah. You know, you, it really wants to have that blade being put into use, but I guess that spike there is also. The, the, it's yes, you're it's gonna whatever be, you can do, isn't it, really? Again, that, that small spike, great for getting in, into the gaps in the armour. So, yeah, that's, that's the halberd. OK. I mean, well, you, there's, there's more back here. Still. There is. Well, look at the pole axe. This is a very a thin version of it, but the hammerhead there and the counterweights on the end, okay. which can also be used for bashing into your enemy. Its, it's purpose is solely for bashing in armour. Basically, if this armour needs to move, and if you can start bashing in the joints with the hammerheads, it won't move, and if he can't move, he can't fight. As the fighting raged on at the base of Ambien Hill, Henry's force of French pikemen, directed by his ally, the Earl of Oxford, took an unexpected early advantage. 
So the Earl of Oxford, who is in command of the vanguard on Henry's side, has to circle around the marsh and therefore maybe takes Norfolk a bit by surprise there. That seems to be the heat of the fighting, which the Earl of Oxford gets the better of. He's also able to control his men, to pull them back to the standards and then launch uh, another attack. So the vanguard of Richard's army is very seriously damaged. And that, of course, is not good in a battle because the vanguard is the main fighting force, really. It, it, you've got to win that stage of the battle. One hour into the battle, Richard's army found itself under enormous pressure. His vanguard struggled to fight the tight formations of Henry's foot soldiers. Reenactor Thomas Wilmot has come to show me some of the combat techniques that Richard's men would have used. What would your first weapon of choice be then? Uh, in terms of going onto the battlefield, I'd probably lead with something like a pole axe or a glaive. OK. The sort of more heavy industrial side of killing. Yeah. Uh, and once I lose that, because I probably will in combat, we know people talk about it in records of the time, then I'm going to resort to something like a sword. And this is a, a fairly typical sword of a period. OK. <laughs> it's got an awful lot bigger from sort of the time of Hastings, so it's now been able to use in two hands, as I've got no need for a shield. And you won't be using it so much as a slashing weapon, it's more of a stabbing in the crush, one hand on the blade, aiming for gaps in the armour, or even using as a hammer close in. That's a to blunt hammer. In. So quite versatile then, actually, once you start using it in with two uh, hands yeah, like the, that. The Swiss Army knife of weapons in a lot of ways. You can do a lot of stuff with them. Can I have a little yeah. feel of that? So we, well, it's, got, yeah, it's got a decent weight to it. This would have been fairly representative. Yeah, it's it? a fairly typical example of the time. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, and I guess you're just not going to be having the, the space about you to get large slashing motions in against your enemy, are you? You also are going to be fighting with your own troops, so if you take a massive backswing, you're really going to start to fall out with your comrades behind you as well. The, the sort of the ultimate medieval brutality would be picks and hammers. So this is a, a cavalry pick, and this is designed for concussion and penetrating armour. With something like that on a downward swing, you stand a fighting chance that it will grip and penetrate the armour. So th this is really quite industrial now, then. You're getting down to real nitty-gritty. Yes. There's not even space for your sword. No, it, you have to have a mindset that you're willing to inflict an unbelievable level of brutality on the person you're fighting. Well, we've got a number of shorter weapons on here. I mean, there's, you're getting right down to something like this, which is well, more of a dagger, really, yeah. isn't it? Uh, stuff like this is very good if you are getting into the wrestling stage. This will find gaps in armour, so there are gaps in the front of my plates. There are gaps here. It might go through that. And that is probably what kills the majority of people on battlefields. Everything in medieval warfare boils down to slashing, stabbing or smashing. And one of those things will find a way to kill you. During two hours of battle at Bosworth, King Richard III was desperate to cling to the throne and defend his royal dynasty, the House of York, with the support of the Dukes of York and Northumberland. But Henry Tudor challenged Richard's right to be king. His French pikemen were slaughtering large numbers of the king's advance force, or vanguard, that was led by the Duke of Norfolk. King Richard's last hope for victory was to bring forward his rearguard forces, led by Northumberland. In some medieval battles, the rearguard is literally at the back of, a, of one, two, three, the vanguard. The main battle, the rearguard is at the back. We think at Bosworth that the rearguard under the Earl of Northumberland is commanding the left flank of Richard's battle. So to look at that, well, here we go. So we've got the great view from up here, actually. We'd have Norfolk on our right. We'd have uh, Richard with his main battle in the middle and Northumberland, we think, on the left flank. Would there have been a, a point in the battle then, a definitive point, when Richard looked to Northumberland to bring his men into the battle? Richard sees that you know, things are not going well on his right flank. He is frustrated himself in that he can't do much because the Earl of Oxford has led Henry's army to attack Richard's right flank. And there's little he can do to intercede without losing his vantage of view. Uh, so Northumberland, yes, the role of the rearguard is to come in when required, but he doesn't. And the jury's still out on exactly why that is. There's a theory that Northumberland in the rearguard didn't actually enter the fight because he didn't want to, but do you think maybe he physically couldn't enter the battle? There's a marsh between the two armies, and it could well be that the Earl of Northumberland physically can't advance anywhere because there's a marsh in the way. Richard III and Northumberland had another problem. A third army, led by powerful nobleman Sir William Stanley, whose allegiance was unknown, 
was watching the battle unfold. The Stanleys were an important northwestern family. They'd been around for quite a long time. These local lords were very, very powerful indeed and could um, get quite a decent military company together. The important thing at this point is that they'd been in some dispute, or Thomas Stanley had with Richard over property. We also know that Henry had met with them before the battle, a few days before, so maybe they had already promised support. Stanley's presence on the battlefield presented a tactical dilemma for Northumberland. We've got the Stanley army, we believe, to Northumberland's left flank. He can't attack Stanley because at this stage he could be his friend. He can't ignore him either because if he was to advance or turn to support Norfolk, then the Stanleys could attack him from the rear or the side, yep. which would be disastrous for them. How important was the fact that Northumberland's men didn't enter the fight? Well, it's arguably incredibly crucial because essentially Richard's lost up to a third of his army. We, we still don't know the exact numbers even that were involved in this battle. Yeah. Um, all we know is that, that Richard's army is supposed to be twice the number of Henry's, but if you add Stanley's forces, they're about even. One theory that I've heard is that maybe there were deals that had gone on kind of behind the scenes, kind of cloak and dagger deals that maybe had, had taken place between the noblemen? I think it's Jean Molinet who's writing from, for the Castilian court, and he's using the French uh, mercenaries on Henry's army as his eyewitnesses to, the, to this. And he suggests that the Earl of Northumberland makes no move in the battle because he's already done a deal with Henry. Um, we don't know how true that is. Um, we know that Henry and the Stanleys had met before the battle because they met at Atherston um, a couple of days earlier. Richard III hadn't exactly proved himself to be the most popular of kings. Were loyalties a bit questionable around this time? Throughout the Wars of the Roses, loyalties could be questioned. People, you know, families who might have at one stage supported, you know, the Lancastrians or the Yorkists could easily swap over. Sometimes in the middle of a battle, they might swap over. Um, so, yeah, I mean, loyalty was always something that, that certainly a medieval king would be very nervous about. Richard knows that his enemy's army is half the size of his own. The question is, how much does he trust his army? The Stanleys were waiting watching from on top of a hill. If they joined Henry, they had to be certain his side would win, because if Richard won, they'd be cast as traitors and lose their land, as well as their heads. And it seemed that Northumberland was also holding back. Richard was forced to take matters into his own hands. Richard catches sight of Henry Tudor and he's relatively isolated on, on the battlefield. He's with his immediate entourage, with his, his retinue of, of supporting knights, but he's there and he's within reach. And so Richard concludes that if he can reach uh, Henry Tudor and kill him, it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of the battle, he's won. So you have to imagine, you know, Richard with his, with his knights and King Wright, this is it, it's now or never, we'll go for it. And it was basically, let's ride hell for leather and try and get to him. So you have to imagine these, these, these mounted knights in their armour coming across the, the, the battlefield, somehow skirting the marsh that was here and making for their target, Henry Tudor. Richard himself kills uh, Henry Tudor's standard bearer, whose job is to be next to Henry Tudor. And what may have saved Henry um, was the intervention of a giant of a man called Sir John Cheney, who was one of his, one of his knights, um, an enormous man. He was known to be, you know, well over six foot. And Richard actually manages, he doesn't kill him, but he un unhorses him. Is that a surprise, knowing that Richard was actually quite a small man, no giant himself, and actually suffered from physical deformities? One of the chroniclers said that he was, he, he was slightly built, but he had a great heart. And I think you see this in this, in, in this action, that, you know, he's up against uh, you know, a, 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 a big unit, really, in John Cheney. But perhaps Cheney has bought enough time for other people to come forward, hustle Henry Tudor further to the rear, and the charge has failed. But of course, a, a retreat from here is not helped by the fact that a lot of this area is marshland, and, uh, and Richard's horse gets in, in mired in the marsh. He can't escape, even if he wanted to. He's cut off from his own men now, I think, you know, those that are still fighting, because it may well be that many of them are, are retreating anyway at, at this stage. His failure to kill Henry really means that, uh, that 
that the game's up in many ways, that the charge had been seen, and his enemies were closing in on all directions. Richard and his household cavalry were now isolated in the center of the battlefield. Well, there was no escape, really. It appears that his horse got stuck in the marsh that was here, so he probably had to dismount. So I think gradually Richard found himself alone. His, um, his knights had either been killed or had fled. There was no question of him being taken prisoner. So he was surrounded and basically hanged to death. The moments between Richard losing his horse and then losing his life inspired a famous line in William Shakespeare's play about the ill-fated king. There's quite a common perception of Richard III being this bitter, twisted, physically deformed and well, evil king. I mean, does Shakespeare have quite a lot to answer for that? I think the real big problem with Shakespeare's play, the whole a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse speech. A very famous line, yeah. At Bosworth. And people think that that's about Richard looking for a horse to escape from the battlefield because he's a coward and he wants to run away. Now, every other source that we have, contemporary and near contemporary, talks about Richard being incredibly brave on the battlefield. And we have one count of a, a Spanish page offering Richard his horse and encouraging him to escape. And Richard refuses the horse and said, no, I'll, I'll leave this battlefield as King of England or I won't leave it at all. So where does Shakespeare get this from, that, that Richard was a coward? Well, I don't think he does. I think that's a, a misreading of Shakespeare's play, because if you actually look at the scene, Catesby, one of the other characters, says to Richard, oh, you want a horse to escape? Here, I'll get you one. And Richard says, no, you idiot. He says, I've killed five people so far that I thought were Henry Tudor, and I need a horse to go back in there to find the real Tudor so that I can kill him. And yet people have managed to misread that over centuries to be a piece of cowardice on Richard's behalf that I don't think even Shakespeare accused him of. It's odd to think that at this now beautiful spot in the middle of England, a king was hacked to death. Many of those who died are buried in this churchyard at Dadlington, just south of the battle site. The last known location of King Richard III's body was a friary in Leicester. That was later closed and destroyed, after which his whereabouts became a cold case for hundreds of years. But 512 years later, in August 2012, archaeologist Matthew Morris and his colleagues started looking for him again. We knew he was buried in Leicester. We knew he was buried in the Franciscan Friary in Leicester. But, and we also knew that 50 years after he was buried, the church was demolished. And since then, all trace of it has been lost. And so we had this challenge. Could we find a 500-year-old missing King of England? And our uh, research of historic records led us um, to an area of Leicester, just south of Leicester Cathedral, where we are today, which at the time we started the excavation used to be the social services car park of Leicester City Council. As the digging got underway, so did the discoveries, starting with confirmation of the friary's location. Matt has agreed to show us where their search began, in an area that's now been preserved in a special museum. If we were standing here 500 years ago, we would be standing in the choir of the church. So the width of this room is about the same width as the choir. Where the stone benches are today would have been the wooden choir stalls as well. And over here, this is the very first trench we dug. We were starting at this end. We were working that way through the car park. And as we got to here, the digger bucket, the mechanical digger bucket, it lifted up and underneath it we saw a bone which turned out to be the lower left leg of a person. We carried on excavating the trench, we spent another week excavating and confirming that this grave was actually in the choir of the church and then we came back, widened the area so we had the whole grave in it and then excavated the skeleton itself. Professor Turi King was part of the team tasked with identifying the skeleton. Could it have been England's missing king? One of the things that we were looking for as one of the potential sort of characteristics that we're looking for in a set of remains for Richard um, would be evidence of um, hunchback or spinal abnormality, as had been, you know, in Shakespeare's play. Um, and in that contemporary source, which had talked about him having one shoulder higher than the other. So on the 4th of September, 2012, Joe Appleby, uh, who was our osteologist, and I are excavating. And we're starting from the legs and we are moving our way 
up. Um, and we realize that through a sort of various things that are happening, we're not going to be able to uncover this skeleton today. So we stop because we want to keep it as protected as possible. The next day, Jo is continuing the excavation. She has got uh, the skull, she's got the pelvis, and now what she's trying to do is to follow the spinal column up in a straight line from the pelvis up to the skull. And she's working her way up with the vertebrae, and then she realizes she can't find one of them, and she has to kind of dig slightly sideways. And she realizes that the spinal column is curved and going off in a bit of a curve. And she said the hair on the back of her neck went up because she realized what she might be looking at. Up until this point, we had um, a skull. It had some what looked like injuries on it, but this could have been somebody who sort of met with a nasty end. But when you start to put all those things together, including the curvature of the spine, we start to realize this looks like this really could be him. So this is the really iconic uh, photo of Richard III with his remains laid out. And you can see several things right away. The first of these is just how striking the scoliosis is. Um, it's not kyphosis. This is not uh, a hunchback as described by uh, Shakespeare. It's a, a sideways curve of the spine known as scoliosis. By comparing the bone's DNA to that of Richard's living relatives, the team confirmed that the skeleton was indeed his. But what do his remains tell us about the way he died? Richard III had 11 injuries on him and nine of those were on his head. And what that is telling us is that at some point in the battle, his helmet has come off. So this is an image of the front of Richard's skull. And it's actually really good for showing just how few injuries he has on the front. Um, and that is interesting for us because if you look at other sets of remains, so remains, say, from uh, the Battle of Tout and other, other battles in the Wars of the Roses, what you find is they are often disfigured and they are unrecognizable. This completely fits in with what you would expect because this is a change of dynasty. So this is the end of the Plantagenet period. Henry Tudor wants to take the throne. If he's going to do that, he has to be able to show that Richard III has actually died in battle. And for that, you want him to be recognizable. Now, the killer blows for Richard are here on the base of his skull. Now, this is obviously where the spinal column goes up in there. Uh, he's got this wound, a slice injury, thought to be done with something like a sword or a halberd, a staffed weapon, probably a halberd. Um, it has got about six centimeters of brain exposed. So this would have been one of the killer blows. The other one is this one. You can actually see this one. It is actually nicked on the top vertebrae, gone through 10 centimeters of bone and brain and uh, hit on the inside of the skull on the other side. Again, thought to be done with something like a sword or the tip of a halberd, something like that. What it's showing us is, uh, because of the sort of the location and angle of these wounds, is that Richard must have been on all fours at this point, or prone. It's completely consistent with what we know about Richard and his, his final moments, and that we know that he was apparently killed in the thickest press of his enemies. He goes down in battle. Professor King's analysis reveals disturbing details about what happened to Richard's body after his death. The other two injuries that Richard has on him, um, there's one on his 10th rib on the right side, and there is one which shows that there must have been a sword or a dagger that has gone up through the right buttock and uh, gone through the pelvis that way because he has a cut on the inside of one of his pelvic bones. Um, this is consistent with what we know about how Richard, after the battle, has been stripped naked, flung over the back of a horse before being brought back into Leicester, and there are reports of people heaping humiliations upon the body. The Battle of Bosworth marked the end of Plantagenet rule and the beginnings of Tudor England. Against all the odds, Henry had won the crown.